This international hacking network used middlemen to gain access to stolen press releases and would turn them into a profit of over a hundred million dollars. In a nightclub in Kiev, Ukraine, in the spring of 2012, a 24-year-old man named Ivan Turchinov shared a crucial secret with fellow hackers. He confessed a long-standing practice of hacking unreleased press releases from business newswires and selling them to stock traders through a Moscow-based mediator, earning a share of the profits. Along those present in the nightclub was Alexander Irimenko, another hacker familiar with Turchinov's work, who expressed interest in joining the operation. He collaborated with his friend, Vadim Irimolovich. Irimenko successfully breached business wire, obtaining Turchinov's privileged access to the site. Then, they pressured the main Moscow-based leader, known as Egg PLC, to involve them in the operation, resulting in a hostile takeover. This led Turchinov to divide the enterprise, now involving three hackers. Business newswires such as Business Wire serve as central hubs for corporate information that are safeguarding press releases, regulatory disclosures, and other market-sensitive data before spreading globally. Over at least five years, three US newswires fell victim to different hacking techniques, including SQL injections, phishing emails, data stealing malware, and unauthorized login credentials acquisitions. Traders on US stock exchanges created lists of targeted company press releases, informing hackers of the expected release times on newswires. The hacks uploaded the stolen press releases to foreign servers, providing traders access in exchange for 40% of their profits, which were funneled into various offshore bank accounts. Drawing on insights from sources involved in the scheme, the investigation had a thorough examination of chat logs and court documents. Law enforcement later identified this as one of the most significant security fraud cases in US history. The case shows how the internet has changed insider trading. Traders didn't need an insider in a company anymore. They would use hackers who exploited security weaknesses instead. While big companies might have strong security, the ones they worked with, like financial institutions, law firms, brokerages, or newswires, might not be so secure. A key point is that company security levels became somewhat irrelevant due to the human factor. There's always the risk for an employee falling for a phishing email or willingly giving away their password for money. Scott Borg, the director of the US Cyber Consequences Unit, says that almost every organization with financial data of interest to traders has likely been hacked at some point. These hacks are often discreet, sophisticated and targeted. Companies often don't report them to avoid liabilities and damage to their reputation or because they're not sure how much information was stolen. In the past eight years, the US Securities and Exchange Commission SEC, has improved its ability to detect cybercrime by creating new cyber teams. It has also encouraged companies to strengthen their cybersecurity and report breaches promptly. While these efforts have had some success, the game between hackers and security measures continues. Even the SEC itself faced a security breach in 2016, which wasn't disclosed until the following year, leading to accusations of hypocrisy. When Ivan Turchinov started talking about his scheme in around 2012, the US Secret Service, responsible for protecting the nation's financial infrastructure, began investigating. From the start of 2012, the three major newswires Business Wire, PR Newswire, and Market Wire constantly work to fix security issues and remove malware. According to court documents, after being notified of a potential breach, PR Newswire hired the cybersecurity firm Stroz Freiburg in March 2012 for a thorough investigation. Turchinov's malware was identified and removed. In a state of panic, he sent a desperate message to his associates in Moscow on March 27th, presumably referring to internal newswire emails he had access to. When you get back here, write to me right away. There are several problems. The first and largest is the PR is effed up. They detected the module and removed all our shit from there. They took away the temporary server. I haven't gotten to the new one yet. I'm waiting. 
This happened on the 13th of March. However, by May 30th, 2012, with help from their new friend, Iri Manko, the hackers regained access to PR Newswire and resumed their illegal activities. In response, the US Secret Service dedicated to get help from Ukraine's intelligence service. The Ukrainian team started keeping an eye on Turchinov, closely watching what he did every day. Turchinov was seen hanging out with 10 other guys in their 20s, including his friends, Iri Manko and Ira Molovich. This group had a lot of cash and it wasn't clear where it came from. Turchinov was rumored to have a fancy house in Conscious Asper, often called Kiev's Beverly Hills. On social media, he showed off a collection of gold clocks, a gun, a fancy car, and pictures of himself and his friends enjoying the nightlife in Kiev. Despite receiving a visit from US Special Agent Pari Silla, Turchinov kept hacking press releases, now with the support of elements within Ukraine's intelligence services. According to Ukraine's cyber police chief, Serhii Demediak, Demediak mentioned that intelligence agents ran a parallel operation with Moscow-based middlemen, using Turchinov's access and finding their own traders. Demediak acknowledged Ukrainian intelligence agents might have made illegal profits from trades, saying, that's what, in fact, happened. And that needs to be admitted. In court, a government witness identified someone known as Valerie, as the main guy, with a person named Roman as his contact with traders. Online sources pointed to someone using the screen name Egg PLC as the supposed ringleader. Demodeic, along with unnamed sources, believed Egg PLC is a stock trader in Moscow, originally from St. Pittsburgh. Since around 2008, Egg PLC has supposedly been recruiting hackers. On dark web forums, there were instances of Egg PLC looking for hackers to help breach brokerage accounts. Someone connected to the scheme explained that Egg PLC would manipulate share prices by exploiting brokerages, basically doing a pump and dump stock scam. According to Demodeyuk and those who knew about the scheme, Egg PLC recruited Turchinov roughly around 2009 to hack the newswires. Turchinov would send the stolen press releases to Egg PLC and two other Moscow-based middlemen who then passed them onto the traders. The hackers got a 40% share of the profits and the middlemen took a 10%. Evidence from the inactive ICQ numbers, a once popular messenger service in Russian language hacking circles, suggested that Egg PLC ran a comprehensive business through the dark web. In St. Pittsburgh, Moscow, Kiev and the United States, more and more traders got involved with the stolen press releases. This included people working for investment companies and independent operators. The networks grew as friends brought in other friends, creating interconnected circles. Among the traders were the Dvoboy brothers, Pavel and Arkady, from one of Ukraine's most prominent Baptist families. In the 1990s, several family members got wealthy by privatizing Ukraine factories. Arkady, who owns an ice cream factory, moved to the suburbs of Atlanta in the mid-1990s under a law offering refugee status to persecuted religious minorities from the Soviet Union. Pavel, who studied in the US near Arkady, moved to Kiev when their cousin Alexander was elected to parliament in 2007. While in Ukraine in November 2010, Pavel, according to court documents, sent an email to Arkady's business partner giving instructions on accessing the stolen press releases. Arkady and his business partner, Alexander Gargusha, traveled from their homes in Alpharetta, Georgia, to the Atlanta airport, where they met Vitaly Korcheska, a Slavic Baptist pastor and trader based in Philadelphia. As a former portfolio manager and vice president at Morgan Stanley, Korcheska earned a strong reputation for providing financial planning advice within the new immigration community, many of whom had limited English proficiency and understanding of life in America. In addition to his financial role, Kojeski was a prominent religious figure in the US-based Slavic Baptist community, often invited to preach in various locations around the US and the former Soviet Union. 
In the early 2000s, after his work at Morgan Stanley in New York, Korzewski would travel almost two hours back to South Philadelphia. There, he spent evenings driving around the suburbs, visiting Slavic Baptists to attract them to his small Christian gatherings. Over time, he organized a union of 28 Russian-speaking churches and invested a significant part of his income to establish his church in Philadelphia. Korzewski also sponsored many Congress members to immigrate from the former Soviet Union, providing them lodging at his house until they found work and housing. A Slavic Baptist leader who has known Korzewski for three decades described him as a religious and ambitious person, emphasizing his leadership qualities and the admiration people had for him. Akadi and Gargusha met Korzewski at an airport restaurant during his layover in Atlanta to discuss the scheme. Initially unimpressed, the pastor deemed the printed releases that they presented as publicly available. Arkady, who was initially skeptical, left the meeting, dismissing it as another one of his younger brother's devious ideas. Technical difficulties hampered a second meeting, but on the third attempt, when the group gained proper access to the server to demonstrate the scheme, Korzewski finally acknowledged it's feasible. Akadi started opening brokerage accounts. He granted Kojevsky permission to trade with his funds and compensate him with approximately 10% of the profits. Kojevsky, setting up a Philadelphia fund, conducted secret trades from his own accounts, leading to the group's eventual surveillance by middlemen for failing to pay the full commission. During this time, Akadi engaged in a separate venture, introduced by his brother Pavel. He collaborated with Vladislav Kolovsky, a former Wall Street trader, dividing his time between Odessa and Brooklyn. Akadi opened accounts for Kolovsky. Furthermore, Akadi sent his son, Igor, to learn trading at Kolovsky's Odessian firm. The operation continued to expand, involving friends, family, colleagues, and fellow congregants who brought more individuals into what appeared to be a foolproof path to wealth. Two managers from Arkady's Ukrainian companies established accounts and two relatives in Odessa also became participants. A year later, Arkady's accountant and fellow church member, Leonid Mamutok, joined the endeavor. Possessing some knowledge of the stock market, Mamutok opened additional trading accounts, including one under his brother's name. The strategy involved diversifying entities and accounts to make it more challenging for regulators to detect and investigate. For someone of Kochevsky's caliber, a registered US investment advisor with over a decade of experience, leveraging the stolen press releases represented an effortless way to generate income. On August 3rd, 2011, a statement from Dendrian Pharmaceuticals was released on PR Newswire at 3.34 p.m. and published less than 30 minutes later at 4.01 p.m., just after the market closed. The release revealed that the company's new drug wouldn't meet its target sales. At 3.56 p.m., four minutes before market close, Kochevsky bought 1,100 put options, allowing him to sell the stock at a specific price within a set time frame. The next day, Dendrian's stock dropped by 67%, letting Kochevsky sell his put options for a profit of over $2.3 million. Phone records show that Korzewski made two calls to Akadi's office before the release was published and two more after he sold the put options. Igor Dubovoy, Akadi's son, emailed Korzewski asking for advice on selling all stocks. In response, Igor closed the Dubovoy's group's position, resulting in a loss of $114,000 he then told Kochevsky about it, expressing uncertainty. Kochevsky reassured Igor, saying, It's okay, not the last day. It was strange anyway. Got the numbers right. Reactions mixed. In Ukraine, Pavel, who shared an account with his brother, Arkady, managed the payments of hackers' commissions using his British selling company. Pavel transferred funds through account numbers provided by an unidentified person, likely Roman. In a February 2012 email, confirming payments to Akadi, Pavel revealed a $95,000 transfer to Turchinov's bank account, labelled 
the guys. The payment was distinguished as a transaction for building equipment from McCarty's property development company. The email also noted a $160,000 payment to Vlad Kalupskai, the Ukrainian US trader giving investment advice. Pavel also sent anticipated company announcement wish lists to Akadi in Georgia and the hackers through the Moscow leads. The details of Pavel's initial connections with Roman, who introduced him to the scheme and worked for its main leader, are unclear. Pavel's professional background is not entirely clear either. His cousin, Alexander, a politician, described Pavel as a technical specialist and freelancer involved in property development. Alexander was unsure about Pavel's trading abilities. Pavel claimed he had no broker account, never made any trades, and said he didn't know the details of the case or why it was implicated. In November 2014, almost two years after Agent Perry Sellers visit to Kiev, the third hacker, 27-year-old Iri Molovich, was on vacation in Cancun, Mexico. While relaxing in the hotel restaurant after midnight, Mexican law enforcement officers approached him, saying he wasn't welcome in Mexico and arranged for his return to Ukraine through the Ukrainian consulation. However, upon landing in Dallas, Texas, the passages in the front four rows revealed themselves as US secret agents, indicating that Irmolovich had been handed over to the US law enforcement by the Mexicans. Initially charged with selling data from over 300 stolen corporate payment databases, Irmolovich's laptop, which was confiscated by Mexican authorities, also contained evidence related to press releases. After being transferred to the Hudson County Correctional Facility in New Jersey, US authorities gave Irimolovich a choice. Serve two to three years or face a 20 year sentence. He was encouraged to accept a plea agreement. Even with one of the hackers in custody, unraveling the entire network proved challenging. Irimolovich, the arrested hacker, claimed he had no knowledge of the traders and only engaged in online conversation with the Moscow ringleaders. Additionally, the traders strategically accessed and read the press releases on an offshore server, minimizing traces of evidence. Experts point out that avoiding detection in the type of insider trading often depends on how much a trader does to stay unnoticed. Identifying a trader using inside information becomes nearly impossible if they consider changing their trading locations, even with collaboration from multiple countries. Traders can further obscure their tracks by anonymously establishing credit ratings at brokerages through cryptocurrencies or shell companies that they subsequently close down. The Double Void Group displayed somewhat less caution. Since 2010, the SEC's Analysis and Detection Center, working with Wall Street's self-regulator, the financial industry regulator authorities, FINRA, has been monitoring the market for indicators of insider trading. The algorithms are designed to detect stock price and fluctuation before major corporate announcements, suggesting that those engaging in buying or selling possess insider knowledge. The SEC Center for Risk and Quantitative Analytics then scrutinizes the flag trades. FINRA helped the SEC in looking into the press release case. The regulators proceeded by knowing the stolen press releases were affecting the markets. They checked logs for suspicious trades and gradually found connections among some of the people involved. The Double Void Group showed a habit of using the same brokerage accounts over and over. Some accounts were directly owned or linked to immediate family members with shared last names. Also, their connection was easily confirmed through their shared membership in the same church community. In 2014, the middlemen found out that the Double Void Group was making trades from a much larger number of accounts than they had revealed. Threats were then made to Pavel, revealing in court testimonies. Arkady went to Ukraine in 2015, where he even met Valery, identified as the main guy. Roman, their middleman contact, suggested different options for the group to fix the situation and regain access, like paying $50,000 per day for continued server access or $100,000 per week, along with a $300,000 deposit. These amounts showed the increasing value of the releases on the black market. Their first attempts didn't work. Eventually, 
the group came up with another way to get the releases through Valery Vychenko, the husband of Arkady's cousin. He managed to establish contact with the middlemen through his own channels. Vychenko would send the releases to himself using a discreet email account, which Igor would then access and forward to Vitaly. However, similar to the newswise practice of not telling clients about security issues, the middlemen chose not to reveal to the traders that one of their hackers had been caught. Nine months after Iramolovich was arrested in August 2015, FBI agents took Pastor Vitaly Kochevsky, described as having graying slicked back hair from his wealthy suburban home in Philadelphia. On the same day, Arkady, Igor, Garkusha and Momo Tok were also arrested at their homes in Georgia. Kochevsky was accused of gaining $17.5 million illegally, Arkady over $11 million and Igor $250,000. Momotok and Gakusha were charged with making approximately 1.3 million and 125,000 respectively. This news shocked the US Slavic Baptist community, especially Kojevsky's congregation, where many members were hesitant to believe he was guilty. The historical prosecution of Baptists under the Soviet Union has made this community disruptful of authorities and the media. Kochevsky's supporters argued that the case was a plot by the US government to persecute the Christian leader. In his defense, Kochevsky's legal team argued, and a US prosecutor admitted to the court, that there was no evidence of press releases found on Kochevsky's computers, or no indication of his communication with the hackers. According to witness testimonies, Kochevsky was careful in his actions. He often traveled to Ukraine for trading purposes using computers funded by Arkady. He took care to erase evidence and often left technical equipment behind in Kiev. An FBI forensic specialist testified that they couldn't reconstruct deleted attachments believed to be press releases. Instead, the prosecutors in the indictments pointed to Gojevsky's trading patterns, which often mirrored those of other defendants accused of trading on the releases. They also presented emails and chats between Gorjevsky and other members of the Dubovoi group discussing trades. During the legal processings, some Slavic Baptist leaders advised congregations not to discuss the matter publicly and encouraged prayers. After his arrest, supporters created a Pray for Vitaly Gorjevsky Facebook page and occasionally gathered to pray outside the courthouse during his hearings. I urge you, please, not to hastily draw conclusions, appealed Pastor Constantine in Portland, Oregon, a week after Kochevsky's arrest. He is a man of God. It surprises me, brothers, that we would so quickly align with non-believers to the detriment of what we know about our own brother. I am embarrassed to acknowledge that there are members of this church who have allowed themselves on the internet to assert he is a wolf in sheep's clothing. I pose a question, what right do we have to judge another? Who do you think you are? After initially pleading not guilty, Garkusha, followed by Momotok, Arkady and Igor all changed their pleas to guilty before the trial. They were all waiting for sentencing. When a member of the Pray for Vitaly Kochevsky Facebook group posted about their guilty pleas in 2016, the administrator responded, how do you know these other guys didn't get paid off by the government to lie to the judge? Watch, they will get a slap on the wrist and a few million each. I think you underestimate the government's abilities to create a situation when they need one and their ability to get whatever they want. I recommend you really search inside yourself and ask yourself who the real criminal is here. Kochevsky's church has faced significant challenges due to the case. After the US government froze his funds, the congregation worked together to cover his legal expenses. Reportedly, Kuchevska used some of the money from his trading activities to buy nine properties in the Philadelphia suburbs, a strip mall, and a 9% stake in a Georgia apartment complex. According to those who know him, at least five houses were purchased for new immigrant families without establishing credit ratings. 
When asked about the properties, Kuchevsky confirmed, Yes, it is true actually, all of them. I did not buy anything for myself. The impact of his church community has been profound. A Baptist leader, who has known Kuchevsky for three decades, expressed, It really shocked people because they did not think that he could do anything wrong because he had done so much good for them. He is really heartbroken. According to the Baptist leader, Kajewska's continued perception of innocence allows him to maintain a positive public image. The only stolen release that the US managed to secure before the arrests in 2015 was one captured in a screenshot by Kulupska on Viber, a mobile application that doesn't retain data. He forwarded the release to his Yahoo account, which was likely scrutinised by the government. When combined with the emails and trading windows, this screenshot served as crucial evidence against the Dubovoik group. After the arrest, Igor provided the FBI with access to an email account containing over 200 releases, claiming to have forwarded them to Kajewska. Kolupska, the Wall Street trader residing in Brooklyn who operated an Odessa trading firm, was apprehended while hiding out in Odessa in February 2017 following his placement under nightly house arrest. Ukrainian authorities honoured an American extraction request, considering Kolupskaya is a US citizen. During the legal proceedings, the group experienced internal discord. Similar to Gajewskaya, Kolupskaya entered a plea of not guilty, contending that he had been misled by the Dava voice. Arkady, Igor and Garkusha, in turn, testified against them in court. Kolupskaya's defence attorney, challenged their credibility by linking them to previous cases involving drug schemes spanning from Panama to Europe and money laundering in Latvia. On July 6th, a jury found Kolupskaya and Kojevskaya guilty on all accounts. Throughout the trial, Kojevskaya's supporters were warned by the judge twice for praying outside the court. Following the verdict, Kojevskaya addressed his congregation in Philadelphia to express gratitude for their support. With a smile, he announced his intention to appeal the verdict. The Lord showed with certainty that they could not present a single piece of evidence that I ever held any information. It doesn't exist. Of course, a story was told that I destroyed the computer, though they found a 17-year-old computer in my house. But God knows, and we can express it bravely before him, that there was nothing of the sort, not a single computer, or cell phone was ever destroyed. Two SEC civil cases were filed against traders at investment and trading firms in Moscow and Kiev, along with individuals in St. Pittsburgh. They argued that there was no evidence showing they had access to unpublished releases or direct contact with the hackers. Unlike Kojewska's case, which had numerous emails and a single stolen release, the SEC civil cases rely only on trading patterns. In the civil case, traders and entities often engage in trades within hours or minutes of each other. Sometimes before public information releases, their choice of stocks seem to align with the hackers' access to the newswires. David Amiyan, one of the defendants, settled for $10 million, claiming an algorithm detected early trades based on someone else's insider information. Iramolovich received a 30-month prison term. The FBI called this the most extensive case of computer hacking and security fraud globally. The SEC disclosed profits exceeding $100 million, but authorities believe more was earned. Charges have been filed against 42 entities involving 20 individual traders out of over 100 identified by the FBI. Pavel, a criminally charged trader, remains at large, shielded by US legal jurisdiction under Ukrainian law. Pavel linked to influential figures, including his cousin in Ukrainian politics, has connections with Kremlin figures, and a former deacon of the church. Members of the World of Life Church, and Alexander Turchinov and the Dubovoy family, shared a fondness for the number seven, which holds significance in the Bible, symbolizing completeness. According to their former pastor, Pavel and Alexander Dubovoy have phone numbers with multiple sevens, and both Alexander Turchinov and Alexander Dubovoy have customised card licence plates featuring the same digits. 
While there's no evidence linking Alexander Turchinov to Pavel's trading activities, his representative denies any association with Pavel, but acknowledges closeness to Pavel's cousin, Alexander Dubov. A dispute arose between Pavel and Alexander, and one of the pastors, because of their financial contributions to a new church for the World of Life congregation. Despite the conflict, in July 2017, the trio assumed control of the church from the previous pastor who had led their congregation over a decade. Speaking broadly about the communication and the case, researcher Panich notes that, due to the limited financial resources, churchgoers often rely on support from politicians and affluent members, leaving judgment to God. When the news of the US case broke in 2015, Pavel reportedly left for Belarus, returning a year later with a different passport. Pavel is seen living openly, attending church services and even travelling abroad, with a check-in on Facebook in Iran. Ukrainian law enforcement says the situation with the press release case didn't get much attention in Ukraine or from the Baptist community there. However, Pavel became involved in a major corruption case in 2017 which was highlighted in a BBC propaganda program. The Ukrainian Anti-Corruption Bureau accused Pavel of attempting to bribe one of their agents to stop an investigation into his cousin's factory in Odessa and alleged mafia connections of the Odessa mayor. Leaked documents revealed Pavel offering $100,000 to the agent to unfreeze his cousin's bank account and an additional $200,000 when the freeze was lifted and an extra $200,000 to close the case completely. Pavel's life faced more turmoil when he reportedly suffered three gunshot wounds in February. According to his cousin Alexander Dubovoy, he mentioned that Pavel got injured while trying to rescue an unknown woman from attackers during a cafe meeting. Alexander Dubovoy clarified that the group, including Pavel, didn't see the scheme as against their faith. They didn't consider it theft. Instead, Pavel was viewed as a conduit, passing on a tool without knowing its eventual use. The FBI chose not to officially comment on the press release case, or the alleged involvement of the Ukrainian intelligence service. The hacker Turchinov managed to avoid consequences after the scheme collapsed. Later, in 2016, he hacked Ukrainian's fiscal service database for a different Ukrainian business group. According to Demodiak, Ukrainian cyber police chief, he changed taxes and stole information. When investigations began in January 2017, Turchinov escaped through Ukrainian war-torn eastern territories to Russia, out of reach of US and Ukrainian authorities. For Irimanko, the press release indictment marked a challenging time in his hacking career. After US indictments in August 2015, Individuals from Ukraine's intelligence service and Turchinov took advantage of Yurimanko's lack of knowledge about Ukrainian extraditional war to blackmail him. Yurimanko paid the blackmail son to avoid extradition, even though he was legally protected. This video would not be possible without the journalist Isabel Koshi. A link to her article will be in the description. And thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that video, feel free to subscribe. And watch another video if you're interested.